All right, this evening uh, we're going to be looking at a few different verses. I just want to begin with um, the reading of a couple of verses from Isaiah 59, uh, verses 1 and 2. I think, uh, as you know, uh, the book of Isaiah is probably not a book that we read all the time. At least it's, it's not one that I do, but there's some verses in it that we're very familiar with, and I think that these may be uh, a couple of those verses. Uh, having to do with prayer and particularly impediments to prayer, things that get in the way of our prayers, reasons why the Lord won't answer our prayers. Uh, this is what uh, Isaiah says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Uh, may the Lord bless uh, this part of his word to our understanding uh, this evening. Now, as you already know, this morning we were looking at the subject of spiritual growth, the idea that growth is possible that growth is what the Lord desires for us. And of course, we've seen some of the reasons why he desires it. John was telling us in the passage we looked at this morning about three different stages of growth, three different levels of maturity in God's kingdom, which he called children and uh, young men and fathers. But again, we understand it's meant to be applied universally uh, to all the people of God. You know, we're all somewhere in the continuum between newly born and uh, fully mature, and we need to be, uh, of course, growing. Now, when we first come to Jesus, we were children. We didn't know very much. We saw we were inexperienced in God's Word, but we did know a couple of things. We knew our sins were forgiven. That's why we came to Jesus, that we might find relief from the concerns we had, from the guilt which we knew was ours by looking at the law of God. And we knew that those were forgiven in the Lord Jesus, and we also knew that we had a new relationship with the Father. Being adopted into his family, he was our Father, we were his sons and daughters, or we are his sons and daughters. We knew that the Lord loved us. We knew that as a Father, he was committed to caring for us. And we knew that he would keep us safely in this world and take us eventually to heaven. And we also saw something else, we, something maybe we didn't realize when we were really young in the Lord, but as we grew in the Lord, we began to realize, and that is that the Lord was protecting us from the warfare that we were already actually in because we had entered into his kingdom. We had sided, as it were, with the kingdom of light and immediately became the enemy of the kingdom of darkness. But the Lord was sheltering us from that warfare until we were ready for it, until we had gained more experience in his word. He also blessed us when we were in that particular phase with a unique sense of his great love, of his nearness, experiencing blessing in our fellowship with him, seeing what, what I, at least I recall, immediate answers to prayer. The Lord was extremely gracious. But he was preparing us, of course, for the next stage when things changed, when things became a bit more difficult, when we had grown and become adults. Now that we had learned something about how we were to live and had become a bit more like his son, it was time for us to face the spiritual warfare that he had called us to, to experience victories by using the spiritual weapons of warfare which he has given to us, which are part of the means of grace, but also defeats in the conflict. And I think we all know that there are times when we are defeated. But both of these things, again, so that we might continue to grow. Now, John also spoke of a final stage of maturity that we will all attain to in heaven, but few seem to attain on earth, although it's something we should all be striving for, where we know Jesus as Paul knew Jesus. Not only in the power of his resurrection, which is, again, what we're looking at this evening, how can we experience more of this power, the power of his Holy Spirit, the Spirit who raised him from the dead, the Spirit who is working in us to make us more like Jesus. How can we experience more of that power? But Paul knew that power, but he also knew Jesus in his sufferings. And of course, if we 
follow the Lord, if we do what he calls us to do, that is what we'll experience as well. As by his Holy Spirit we're made willing to do whatever it is the Lord calls us to do, to give up anything that he calls us to give up in order that we might grow more into his image and do more for his glory. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul was willing to do. That's what the Lord is working in us. That's what we need to be striving for. Now we concluded this morning by considering the means or the ways that the Lord has given us to grow. Seeking him in prayer is one of those ways. Of course, studying and applying his word, which we've been looking at. Joining together for worship and fellowship. Exercising the grace which he gives to us through these means by fighting against our sins and striving to do what he calls us to do. Now, this evening, as I've already mentioned, I want us to consider the relationship between our obedience or our growth in grace and how much we benefit from the things the Lord has given to strengthen us because there is a relationship between them. There is a correlation between them. And what we want to see is this, that the greater our obedience which is the same as our, the greater that our growth in grace is, the more we mature in the Lord, the more we will benefit from these means because the more we're going to have of the Spirit's influence in our lives, uh, who is the one who makes us to benefit from these things. Now, we're going to be looking at prayer as an example, but we're going to close by just considering briefly that this really applies to everything else that the Lord has given to us, to his word, to fellowship, to worship, and everything else. Now, first of all, we see from Isaiah, or the, text, the text we've just read, that uh, disobedience, sin, that comes from a lack of God's Holy Spirit, from a lack of maturity, of growth in grace, can create a roadblock in our prayers to God. Again, let me read the text in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, sometimes when we pray, the Lord doesn't answer, and maybe we don't understand why it is that he doesn't answer us. Well, Isaiah, first of all, wants us to know that it's not because of a, any deficiency in God, uh, because of any limit on his abilities uh, to help us. It isn't that we're in a place where he can't reach us, as it were, with his, with his hand, uh, that his arm, so to speak, isn't long enough uh, to reach where we are. We know from Scripture that the Lord is infinite, and that really applies to everything that the Lord possesses, all of his characteristics. He is infinite with regard to space. He's everywhere. The Lord, sometimes we don't understand this, but he is just as much here as he is in heaven. He's just revealing himself in a different way. In heaven, it's in blessedness. And here, it, it is as we meet together, but not quite like it is in heaven, which means that the Lord is just as much where we are when we need his help as he is here or he is in heaven. God is present to help. Everything about God, as I've said, is unlimited. God also has unlimited power. His arm that is able to reach us also has the power to deliver us. There's nothing that God cannot do if that is what he really wants to do. He can reach us. He can save us. Now, Isaiah also tells us that he isn't hard of hearing. Nor is his ear dull that it cannot hear. Now, again, we understand that God has neither an arm nor literally has an ear. We understand this is accommodated language. We call it uh, anthropomorphisms. He relates to us in terms that we can relate to, we can understand Isaiah is telling us here that God can hear. He can hear our requests for help. You know, the Lord doesn't actually even have to hear us because uh, he already knows what we need. 
uh, our prayers that we offer to the Lord when we ask him for help are really more for our sakes than they are for his. The Lord wants us to vocalize our needs. He wants us to express our needs and look to him to meet these so that when he does meet these needs, we'll be more aware of the fact that he is the one who did it, more than if God were simply doing what it is we needed without ever asking him to do it. But the fact is, God knows our needs even before we ask. Like I said, the asking is really for our own benefit. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. David writes in Psalm 139, verse 4, Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. I mean, God knows the situation. God knows our need. He, he knows what we're going to pray even before we pray. Uh, that's what it means that God has infinite knowledge. It means that he can't learn anything. It means there's nothing he doesn't already know. It means that we can't tell him anything that he isn't already far more aware of than we are. So his ear is not dull. He's not deaf. He hears and even knows what we're going to say even before we say it. So the problem of unanswered prayer Isaiah is telling us, is never with God. So then what is the problem of unanswered prayer? Well, obviously there's a few reasons that God may choose not to answer our prayers. It's not always sin, okay? There are other reasons, and I want to make sure we understand that. Maybe it isn't the right time for the Lord to answer our prayers. Maybe we're asking for something that the Lord intends to give us, but maybe it's not time for that yet. For instance, if you know, our youth or our singles looking for a spouse, looking for someone with, you know, with whom to share their lives, someone with whom they can serve the Lord, asking for that is, is a good thing and something that God has promised to give us if, in fact, we are in need of that. We don't have the gift of singleness. But the Lord may hold off answering that prayer because of a couple of things. Maybe the one that he has planned for us isn't ready yet, or maybe we're not ready yet. So later will be better, and the Lord doesn't answer because the answer is yet to come. Uh, maybe what we've asked for isn't good for us, and the Lord won't give it to us because he knows it'll hurt us. Uh, have you ever uh, get, gotten caught up into... Um, you know, what, you know, the health and wealth movement, um, you know, that was a part of my past. And the idea there is that you can ask God for as much money as you want. You can ask him for, you know, whatever healing, whatever problems you have, and the Lord's going to answer that. Um, and maybe we think that we can serve him better if we have more money, if we have that Cadillac, that Mercedes-Benz, or whatever it may be, or if our bodies are well. Well, those things might be good for somebody else, maybe somebody who can handle it, but it may be that the Lord has put us in the situation that he has put us in because it is good for us, and so the Lord withholds it. So that may be another reason why he doesn't answer our prayer. I used to pray for lots of money, and I never got it. I used to pray for healing, and I didn't get that either because the Lord knew it was best for me to be as I am. Now, maybe he had something better in mind, uh, and that's why he doesn't answer our prayers. Maybe we're asking for something, and maybe he has something better down the road. You know, have you ever asked that the Lord might open the door to pursue a particular vocation? Uh, I had certain plans early on in life, and I was thinking I wanted to do one thing, but <laughs> the Lord had a different plan. He had a, a better purpose. His purpose is always better uh, for my life. He has a better purpose for all of our lives. So he may not necessarily answer our prayer until he leads us to see what it is he wants us to do. And then when we ask for that, then he will answer that prayer. I mean, there's, there's many reasons why the Lord may not answer our prayers. But here Isaiah gives us another reason. He may not answer it because of sin. Now, we know that God is, hasn't bound himself to listen to the prayers of those who do not belong to him, although sometimes he does, many times he does, and he is certainly very gracious when he does that. But sometimes the Lord tells us that he won't answer even the prayers of those who belong to him, 
whom he's promised to answer prayer because of sin. And, you know, we need to kind of think about why it is that the Lord doesn't answer our prayers when we are in sin. And there's perhaps a couple of reasons. First of all, sin grieves the Spirit of God and quenches the Spirit's work in our hearts. And that can result in two very negative things. The first one is it can change our motives in what we're asking. Maybe we want something that we should have, but we don't want it as we should want it. Uh, I think, you know, about this. What if we ask the Lord that we might be useful to him, you know, that we might serve him? That's a good thing, something he wants us to do. But what if our heart isn't really in the right place and we're not going to be that useful to him? We really don't want to serve him in the way that we should. The Lord may withhold, giving us the opportunity to serve him until we really earnestly desire to serve him. It can change our motives, and we need to have the right motives. If you read the Puritans, they'll point out on numerous occasions that the thing that drives our prayers to heaven is the desire the Spirit of God places behind them. It's, it's a matter of the heart. God doesn't want to just hear us you know, vocalize words or just sort of parrot words. He wants the heart to be behind it. And if we're in sin, our heart is not going to be where it needs to be when we ask for these things. Certainly, sin and the grieving of the Holy Spirit can change what it is that we're asking for. If our love grows cold towards the Lord, we'll begin to want things that we shouldn't want, things that perhaps benefit us more than they might benefit the Lord, things like a large bank account, things like you know that Mercedes-Benz or whatever it may be. We may seek for things that have to do with us and our glory and our pleasure rather than his. And by saying that again, understand it's not that God doesn't want us to have any pleasure, but we need to find our pleasure in him rather than in things. And so the Lord may not answer our prayers to teach us that what we're asking for is not the best thing for us. Isaiah reminds us he still hears us. He knows exactly what we're saying. He knows what it is that we might need, but he holds off on his answer as a means of discipline to get us to turn away from our sins. That's what he was doing with Israel. As long as you're going this direction, Israel, I'm not going to do what it is you want because you want the wrong things and you want them for the wrong reason. I want you to desire the right things and then I will hear and I will answer your prayers. The Lord will hide his face, hide his face of blessing, the face that we always want to see until we repent. So if we're seeking the Lord for some particular mercy, for something we need, something we believe will be for his glory, and the Lord doesn't answer us, it could be for a number of reasons, but it could be because of sin. Maybe there's something he's telling us that he wants us to do that we are not willing to listen to. If we don't listen to the Lord, he won't listen to us so that we will listen to him. That's the ultimate goal. Now again, that isn't always the reason, but sometimes it is. If the Lord isn't answering our prayers, maybe we need to step back and ask the Lord to show us if it has to do with some particular sin if it is, we need to repent so that the Lord will hear and answer. But now that's the negative side. Let's look at the positive side. If we listen to him, if we obey him, if we yield to the Spirit of God and grow in our obedience, if we become more of what it is he wants us to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will see more answers to prayer. We will see the Lord listening to us. The Lord says in Isaiah 66, verse 2, But to this one will I look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Now we've just seen that the Lord will not regard those who have no regard for him, but the Lord does regard those who do. He looks to those, Isaiah, actually this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah, he looks to those who are humble. That's a part of our growth in grace, isn't it? Because the one who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes the servant of all. 
the Lord does, you know, he looks to those who are humble. He does not look to those who are proud. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 6, you younger men, Likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. God doesn't hear the prayers and answer the prayers of the proud, but he does that of the humble. He gives grace to the humble. He has regard for those who have regard for him. He tells us again in Isaiah that he looks to those who are contrite, and what that means is those who are stricken with a sense of their sin and their unworthiness. To those who are repentant, you see, God does not look or have regard for the unrepentant. David writes in Psalm 51, verse 7, with regard to his own contrition before the Lord for his sin, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Those are the ones that God will favor, who are humble and contrite. And he also says, those who tremble at his word. That is, those who take him seriously, who reverence the Lord, not those who disregard what it is that he has to say. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 120, and really, in a, in a very real sense, this, this is something we ought to experience at some level because I don't believe this was written by an unconverted man, but somebody who was converted, and this is a mark of godliness. He says, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. There is the fear of the Lord, and there is also the love of the Lord. And sometimes we focus so much on love that we forget that there is also this respect, this reverence, this fear we are to have for him. Remember Solomon reminded us a few weeks ago that this is where true knowledge and wisdom begins, with the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the reason is because from this, fear, reverence, respect for the Lord is what causes us to pay attention to what he has to say to listen to his wisdom and his instruction, <clears throat> to trust in his ways over our own ways. Now, with regard to prayer, Solomon writes in Proverbs 15, verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, <clears throat> but he hears, <clears throat> excuse me, the prayers of the righteous. If we're, you know, obviously away from the Lord, completely separated from him, he's not going to listen to us. But even if we belong to him, he may not. He hears the prayer of the righteous. We are righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, we may be in Christ and still not be heard. James writes in James 5.16, as we saw in our meditation, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man, that is one who is humble and contrite and trembles at God's word, can accomplish much. Not because of the person who's praying, but because God hears. And then he goes on in the following verses to give us that illustration of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now we know Elijah was a prophet. We know he was called of God to minister to the northern kingdom. We know that, that God had given to him gifts to, to do miracles and signs and so forth. But you know what, James doesn't bring up any of that. He just brings up the fact that Elijah was no different than we are. He had the same nature that we did. He was a redeemed man. He loved the Lord, but he was still imperfect. He prayed that the Lord would close the heavens for three and a half years, the Lord heard him. He prayed again that he would open the windows of heaven and that it would rain, and the Lord again answered him. And why did the Lord answer him? It's because he was a righteous man. The prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was humble. Elijah feared the Lord. 
Elijah listened to the Lord, and he turned from evil. He wanted what the Lord wanted because he was anointed. He was filled with his Holy Spirit, and so when he prayed, the Lord heard him. You know, if there's one difference between the Old Covenant and the New that we can put our fingers on with regard to people who were converted under the Old Covenant and converted in the New Covenant is the fact that in the New Covenant, we have more of God's Holy Spirit. So we should be able, theoretically, to be more like this, uh, more filled with the Holy Spirit, to be able to live, as it were, a godlier life, perhaps easier than those in the Old Covenant, to be the kind of person the Lord wants us to be. And there are benefits to being that kind of person. The prayer of a righteous man can have very powerful effects because the Lord is more inclined to listen to the prayers of those whose hearts belong to him while the prayer of those who don't love and respect him will have no effect at all because the Lord is not going to listen to them. So the point is, the more we obey, the more we grow in grace, the more effective our prayers will be because they're going to be empowered more by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be the prayer for the things that God wants, and there's going to be the desire for what He wants and to give Him glory in the things we ask. And those are the ingredients along with asking through the Lord Jesus Christ for our prayers to be heard and to be answered. Growth in grace, obedience, being filled with the Holy Spirit makes the means of grace more effective, certainly with regard to prayer. Now, as I've said, this applies to other things as well, to everything that the Lord has given to us to, to strengthen us. They become more effective the more we grow in our obedience to the Lord, the more we seek to honor Him, the more we respect Him, the more we are like Jesus the more we're going to benefit from what he has given us to build us up in Jesus because the Spirit will be more powerfully working in our hearts. We'll be more blessed by the Word. I mean, surely you know the difference by now in your experience that there are times when you read the Word of God and you're really blessed by it and there's times when you read it where it just seems like another book. It doesn't seem like it's really doing anything or there's, there's any effect from this. I mean, why is it that sometimes it's very powerful and life-changing, but other times when we're barely moved by what it says and maybe we don't even want to read it? Well, the difference is the Spirit's work in our hearts is more powerful when it's speaking to us, when, when, he, when the Word of God is speaking to us and less active in us when it's not. The Lord speaks more powerfully to those who, by His grace, want to hear Him. The Spirit makes all the difference. Now, when we desire for the Lord to speak to us because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord will speak to us when we desire, as the psalmist desires in Psalm 119, verse 18. Remember, I quoted this a little bit earlier from the same psalm. And again, pointing out that this is a prayer of a godly man. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Why would anybody want to see that? Why would anybody want to see the wonderful things that the Lord has in his word and in his law except by the Holy Spirit? We need the Spirit of God in order to have this kind of desire. And when we have this kind of desire, the Lord speaks to us more powerfully in his word. When we are growing spiritually, advancing in our maturity, uh, growing in grace, more filled with the Spirit of God, we'll also be more blessed in our worship of the Lord because the Spirit will be working through these means as well to build us up. He'll speak more powerfully to us when the Word of God is read and preached. I mean, some people are barely moved. I remember in the past when uh, some people were terribly offended by some of the things that, that I was saying, the Word of God was saying, and I believe that those things were what the Word of God said. Some were terribly offended, and others were tremendously blessed. You know, what, what made the difference between those two people? The Spirit of God working in their hearts. I have to admit, um, not going to name names, but the person who was terribly offended by it, I don't think that person knew the Lord at all. 
and yet they were a member of a church. That can happen, of course. The, the Spirit of God will move in our hearts to desire more intensely the things for which we pray. By the way, going back to the other example, it wasn't just because of that one sermon. It was a whole pattern of life that it just didn't appear that there was any desire for spiritual things in their life and a, a holding on to or a grasping of things that were clearly against the Lord's will. The Spirit of God, as I've said, in our worship will speak to us more powerfully. He will move in our hearts more intensely to desire the things for which we pray. You know, we'll have the right motive and we'll be asking for the right things and so we'll benefit more from our prayers in worship. He will give us a greater desire to glorify the Lord in our praises that we lift up to Him so there will be power in our worship to the Lord. And He will show us Jesus more keenly and allow us to sense his love more, more clearly, I think, as we come to the supper. Again, the Spirit of God makes all the difference. As we grow in grace and have more of the Spirit's work, we benefit more from the means. The, you know, again, the virtuous circle is, as it helps us to move closer and closer to the image of our Lord Jesus. The Spirit of God will even energize our gifts, spiritual gifts, and we all have at least one, and give us a greater ability through those gifts to build one another up in the Lord, as well as to receive a greater blessing as they minister their gift to us. The Spirit of God will empower that. He'll make us benefit more from that. He will give us a greater power to fight against our sins and to become more of the kind of person that the Lord is pleased to use. I mean, He wants those who represent Him and his gospel, his ambassadors, to be like him. And when we become more like him, he will use us more to do that particular work. Again, the Spirit of God will do that as we grow in grace. And so if we, by his grace, will listen to him as he speaks to us in his word, and we don't resist him, but we yield to the Spirit of God as the Spirit is working in our souls to help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only will our prayers be more effective, accomplish much because they will be heard by God, but we will experience more power in everything that he gives us, both to draw near to him and to serve him. So may the Lord help us to listen. May he help us to trust his word with all our heart and follow it and not lean on our own understanding. May he help us to yield to his Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God leads us in his ways that we might grow in him and experience even more of his power in our lives in all these different ways. May God give us grace. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do this.